Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for having me here. We've heard a lot today about how easy it is um, to commit cybercrime against you as businesses and individuals as well. Um, really what I'm here to do today is to take you through a case study and to show you the real impact that cybercrime can have on your business. So what actually happens at the end of all of this? What do you lose? Um, first of all, I want to touch very briefly on social engineering. We've heard this phrase quite a lot today. I always like to consider it as the human form of hacking. It's the hacking of people. It's how criminals get information out of you in order to go on and commit fraud and um, crime against you. We've heard really well from David how social media tools can be used to help facilitate that as well. Um, if we're thinking about social engineering from a bank point of view and what we see our customers falling victim to, these are probably the main offenders. So you might be familiar with some of these, perhaps some you're not. Vishing is the voice version of a phishing email. It's when someone calls you and purports to be somebody that they're not to try and get information from you. Phishing, we've heard a lot about today, those emails that drop in your inbox look like they've come from a genuine source but of course haven't. Smishing is on the rise. You might have experienced this. It's where a text message is received that looks like it's come from your bank but hasn't. In fact, the technology that the criminals use means that it will appear in the same thread of genuine messages that you've received from your bank. They can be really hard to spot. And then malware, that malicious software that finds its way onto your PC or device, really well demonstrated by Andrew at Interforensics, um, that makes you do things that you don't want to do. So what we'll actually focus on today is a vision case study. Um, first of all, this is a really great website, though. I recommend you jot this down. Have I been pawn.com? I don't think anyone's mentioned this today. Sometimes I get asked, how did the how did the criminal find my information? Well, have I been pawned is a really great resource. It was created by a guy called uh, Troy Hunt. He works for Microsoft Security. You can put your email address in there, and it will tell you whether or not your email has been. Um, hacked as part of a data breach. So when we hear about these data breaches for firms like Adobe, Dropbox, LinkedIn, you hear that so many millions of details have been stolen. And you're never really sure if it's yours or not, but you can put your email address in here and it will tell you whether or not your details were stolen as part of that data breach and also what was stolen. This is why you're always told don't use the same email address and password combination for everything because Actually, sometimes companies can't keep your details secure. And if they're stolen from Dropbox um, and you're using the same credentials for your bank account, well, you're just you're asking for trouble, really. So Vishin, a case study. Um, if I give a very small amount of background, I've worked for RBS now for almost 20 years, and um, I've spent about 15 of those working on fraud, investigating fraud, and now I get to do lovely things like this. Um, this was a case that I worked on a few years ago now with some colleagues. So um, it's for a corporate client, if I give a bit of background, it's a really well-known household name. And the, really, the reason that I emphasise that is because they're a very large organisation with a really sophisticated accounts team, very intelligent people working for them. Um, one of the um, treasury managers received an email and it purported to come from our online banking service. And it was kind of a customer service email asking her whether or not she'd recommend the service. And to complete it, all she had to provide was the user ID that she used to log in to our online service. And she received that. She responded to it. It was a couple of radio buttons to respond to and went on with her day. A couple of weeks later, the company received a telephone call from somebody purporting to be at the bank suggesting that a payment coming into their account was suspicious and required investigation. They knew some information about the account and the relationship they had with the bank, which gave them an air of authenticity. And they suggested that the payment coming into their bank account was so suspicious they were going to freeze their accounts until it was investigated fully. Um, of course, all the caller needed was some information from our customer in order to investigate and then unfreeze their accounts. If you knew who this customer was, you would realise that to suggest to them that their accounts would be frozen and no payments could come in or out was a nightmare. It really would grind their operation to a halt. So they cooperated. And what I'd like to do is play for you a recreation of the call that that company received. So they record all of their ingoing and outgoing calls, maybe some of you do as well, um, which meant when the fraud was discovered later, we were able to listen to the criminals and how they had conned our customer. 
and we've recreated the first call that was made into them. This is pretty much word for word. We've edited it down slightly. It will give you a sense of, of how the criminals approach this type of thing. I'd like you to really listen to some social engineering techniques that the criminal uses throughout. There's quite a lot of tricks and um, a few ways that they manipulate our customer into revealing information and carrying out actions. And I know, because I've spoken to some of you over the breaks, there's this sense that the people who fall for this type of thing perhaps aren't on the ball or are a little bit vulnerable or just all sorts of myths about the people that fall for this type of crime. Um, it's non-discriminatory. Everyone is a target and everyone falls for this stuff. So let's play the call. It lasts about four minutes and then afterwards I'll come back and hopefully you'll have picked up on some of the techniques that were being used. So Ali, if we can play that call. Hello, my name is Charlie Stephan. I'm calling from Money Laundering Operations. Oh, hi. Who am I speaking with, please? This is Alfie speaking. Oh, Alfie Johnson, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Oh, great. The reason why I'm calling is I'm in with the Money Laundering Operations Department from your corporate accounts. We handle your corporate account for incoming and outgoing payments. Right. And we have an amount coming in that's sitting in our money laundering queue. Uh, 8,700. Right, okay. The person's name is Udin Omad. The payment has no reference and this name is on our money laundering watch list. Alright. We've placed the funds on hold and it hasn't gone into your accounts yet. Right. So if you can verify that payment for us and call me back to confirm, then that would be great. Um, I'll give you a case reference number. It's 8745. 8745. Yes, so if you could uh, have a look at this and give me a call back to confirm. Yes, okay. And uh, who's your relationship manager? Because we will need to let them know uh, what's going on as well. It's Lucy Taylor. Thanks to bring up her details. And I'll give her a call to let her know what's going on. Uh, for now, we have suspended any incoming and outgoing payments on your account. Um, I'll need to speak to my supervisor, Emma Harrison. She's the money laundry officer. Can you bear with me a minute and I'll put you through? Yeah, sure. Okay. Hello, good morning. Hi, is this Miss Harrison? Yes, hello. Hi, my name is Charlie Stephan and I'm on uh, the Money Laundering Investigations. Yes. The reason I'm calling is that we have your account on hold at the moment. Uh, there's a payment in for £8,700 coming in from... Yes, I have all the details in front of me. The thing is that this person is on our watch list and if you're the Money Laundering Officer then you should be familiar with our watch list. Yes, of course, absolutely. Uh, I've spoken with your relationship manager, Lucy Taylor, and she had confirmed that the account should be placed on hold until this matter is resolved. Oh, um, okay, uh, right, so uh, we can't pay any money out? No, not until we sort this payment uh, coming in. Uh, right, uh, right. Uh, who are the people at the company that make the payments? Uh, only myself or my colleague Freya. Okay, so until this matter is resolved, you need to let Freya know that she can't use bank money either, okay? Uh, yes, yes, I can. So if you could look into this and call me back, please. Uh, the telephone number to call me back is um, 0845 211 uh, When you get through to the automated menu, press option two for the money laundering team. Yes, I'll, okay, I'll call you back. Thank you for calling the call team. Please note, the call may be recorded for training and monitoring purposes. If you have received an automated call or a letter regarding your debit card, please press 1. To report on usual... Good morning, Fraud Operations. Lily speaking. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, good morning. Can I speak Charlie Stephanie, please? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, do you have a reference number, please? Yes, it's 8745L. Okay, thank you. Just one moment, please. Hello, Charlie Stephanie speaking. Oh, hi, Charlie. It's Emma Harrison here. We spoke about payment for eight thousand seven hundred. Oh yes, yes. Hi, Miss, Miss Harrison. Yes, we've had a look, and we can't. Uh, before we continue, I need to ask you some security questions. Uh, oh right. Um, okay. I know we spoke before. I do recognise your voice, but these calls are being recorded, so. No, I, I understand absolutely. Okay, so from your online banking pin, could you give me the first, third, and sixth digits, please? And that would be eight, three, and one. Thank you. And from your password, could you give me the second, third, and seventh characters, please? Um, yes, that would be A, the number two, and S for Sierra. Great, thank you. And let me give you a challenge code to enter into your smart card reader. Okay, so that's a recreation of the call that the company received. Now let me just explain this a little bit. 
The criminal had researched their target really, really well. They created for them a nightmare scenario to get them to react, to make them carry out an action without really stopping and thinking about what they were doing. So they'd done their homework, they'd created this high-pressure scenario whereby they suggest to our account holder that their accounts were frozen, understanding that that would mean they wouldn't really be able to operate very efficiently. They'd done their homework in the sense that they knew who they were targeting. You might have picked up on a few of these things. So initially the call was made into a chap called Alfie. We've changed the names, obviously, but a chap called Alfie. He sounds quite bored by it all. He's a junior member of staff on the Treasury team. Um, he only really comes to life when the criminal suggests your accounts are frozen until this payment's investigated. She knew his surname. And where do you think that she might have got that from? I mean, it's as simple as can be. They got it from the internet. They got it from company's house or from the company's website. They were both on there. Um, she always wanted to get to Emma Harrison because Emma was the one that made the payments, but she knew if she got to Alfie first, he would put her through to Emma. And psychologically, if you have a call transferred through to you by a colleague, you assume and trust that they've carried out certain actions. And em Emma told us afterwards that she assumed that Alfie had confirmed this caller was from the bank, but of course he hadn't. She used information that was given to her, so she said to Alfie, who's your relationship manager at the bank, we'll need to let her know, um, and he says it's Lucy Taylor, right, okay, I'll let her know, and then not 30 seconds later suggests to Emma that she's spoken with the relationship manager, Lucy Taylor, she's confirmed the account should be frozen. So to Emma, again, this gives this sort of verification that it's really the bank calling. She gives a reference number, which seems to be be a professional thing to do in this type of scenario. There's a couple of other things she does as well. She says to Emma at one point, if you're the anti-money laundering officer, then you should be aware of our procedures. She kind of questions Emma's own role. She says, um, who else at the company uses our online service? Freya does. Well, tell Freya she can't go into bank line for a few hours either until we've investigated. And this is all just setting it up, really. She doesn't want anyone logging into that online service to see what she's about to do. And then, crucially, she gives an 0845 number for our customer to call her back on. Now, that wasn't our 0845 number, but they're purchased very cheaply and very easily online. And cleverly, what the criminals had done was called our genuine 0845 number, recorded our automated menu and played it on their own 0845 number. So when Emma called that back, she's listening to our automated menu and is convinced that she's speaking with us. So what happened next? At the end of that phone call, you heard that Emma provided um, a, a code from her smart card and reader. This is a, a, a process um, that we use to authorise payments. But Emma was told that that was to confirm her identity. So she gives three digits from the PIN, three digits from the password. And what you don't realise is that the criminal is actually logging into our online service as Emma um, when she takes those details. Well, how is she doing that? from that email that she received a couple of weeks ago, asking her to complete that online um, sort of customer service satisfaction survey. All she had to provide was her username for the online banking service. So they'd got that from there, from a phishing email that they'd sent, looking like it had come from the bank. All it wanted was her username, and then over the phone, she's taken three digits from the PIN, three digits from the password. She's logging in as Emma as she talks to her. She takes these codes then, which Emma believes will authorise her identity, but actually authorise three payments from the bank account. There were two payments for £70,000, and there was a third payment for £7 million. Now, that's not a typo. They really did key a payment for £7 million. We think, actually, they had fat fingers. They probably meant to do three payments for £70,000. Um, the thing is, our client had the money to pay this, um, so the two payments for £70,000, they went in the blink of an eye. Now, on this particular day, the payment for £7 million, thank the Lord above, it profiled. So much like if you're using your credit card a lot, or unusually, you might get a phone call that says, is this really you? That payment profiled, which meant it went to one side and somebody from one of our fraud teams eyeballed it agreed with the system that it did look unusual and the process then was to call Emma who'd made the payment um, and ask her if it's genuine or not. Now I've listened to the phone calls where we as a bank call Emma and say Emma there's a payment here for seven million pounds we're just checking that it's genuine and guess what happens? Anyone guess? She won't speak to us. She doesn't believe that we're the bank. And you can understand why. Now she's being phone called by somebody that she's not expecting to hear from. Talking about a payment for £7 million, you know, she, she clams up, she won't speak to us. It really does take some convincing uh, for her to believe we are the bank. 
Of course, she does eventually, um, and, and that's when my team swings into action. So we then get notification of this payment. We stopped the payment for seven million, but as I said, the 140,000 pounds is gone. We investigate, so this was a Royal Bank customer, and when we investigated the two payments that left the bank account, both of them had been paid into a NatWest account, which was quite fortuitous, we could work really quickly. Um, we knew about the fraud within about 25 minutes, so straight away we stopped the NatWest account, but most of the money has gone. It went out in 10 separate transfers to different bank accounts across the UK. Now, when it comes to fraud, banks in the UK, we do not compete. We work mostly very well together. There's, sorry, I giggle because there's one bank that I perhaps wouldn't put into that category, but mostly we work together very, very well. So I will phone my oppos in the other banks and say, you've got a payment coming into X account, can you stop it, please? And they do. They freeze the account, we do the legal stuff later, but importantly, time is of the essence. So there were 10 transfers, there were probably four of us on the phones um, out to those different banks. We knew within 25 minutes all we could recover for this customer was around about 10% of what was paid away, about £14,000. The rest was gone. It was either transferred overseas or it was withdrawn as cash on the ground. Um, when it's transferred overseas, we still follow it, but it's really much, much more difficult to get back. We don't expect that we'll get it back, although we do follow a legal process to try to. Um, so that was our action. We had contact from the fraudster in the sense that the account holder at NatWest, he contacted us wanting to know why he couldn't access his account. So a small amount had been left in his account as a fee. Um, it's a Mool account. He's certainly not the brains behind this operation. So we arranged for him to come into a local NatWest, which was in the City of London, said, if you present some ID, then we'll give you access to your account. And of course, we had the police waiting for him. So he was arrested. He appeared in court. But the criminals got away with it. Now, I don't know if you know the difference between a fraud and a scam. Um, you might not realise that there is a difference. A fraud is what we heard from the gentleman earlier, your debit, credit card being cloned, or the details being used. You've no, you've no part in that process that happens. You didn't authorise the payment. You're going to get your money back. The bank's going to refund you for that. There's a lot of protection there. Scams are different though. Scams are where you've played a part in authorising a payment, even if you don't realise that that's what you're doing. And in the UK, there's a lot of apathy towards fraud and scams. This belief that if you're the victim, you'll get your money back from the bank. And I'm afraid that's just not always the case, particularly if you're a business customer as well. We expect that you will take a certain amount of responsibility to keep your accounts safe and secure. And let's think about this. We can spend all the millions we want to, and let's be honest, we do, on cyber security. But if someone calls you and convinces you that they're from the bank and you hand over information that allows them to make a payment, it's actually quite difficult for us to do anything about that, which is why we're so keen on education and events like this to raise the message. Now, that picture you can see here, it's not... It's not from this case, it's from a case we worked on with the Met Police. They took this in a premises in East London, they raided, they suspected a gang were operating out of doing this type of thing. For me, it just highlights probably what you've heard all day today. The people doing this sort of stuff, it's not all codes and hacking and, and deep system integration. It's nothing like that, actually. Most of what we see at the bank, where our customers are losing significant amounts of money, is done through a, a, a phone and a laptop. Um, their, their, their biggest instrument is, is trickery and convincing you they are who they say they are. Um, so what can you do? Well, actually these tips um, apply for all of the banks in the UK. Um, you'll never be asked to transfer funds from your bank account. You'll never receive a phone call that says, um, we're concerned that your account is at risk. Um, we want you to move your funds to a safe account. It sounds far-fetched, but a lot, a lot of customers fall for that. We'll never call or email you and ask for full or partial PIN, password, or those challenge codes. And the same goes for a text message as well. If you receive a text message with a link to your online banking facility, you can be sure, no matter how genuine it looks, that it's not genuine, because no bank in the UK will do that. We'll never ask you to download screen sharing or remote control software. This is the Microsoft scam we were hearing about earlier. It doesn't just apply to Microsoft. Internet providers as well are targeted in this way. Oh, we're calling from your internet provider. We can see that you've got some connectivity issues. Um, and if you receive a, a suspicious phone call, use a different line to call us back on and use a trusted telephone number, not a phone number that you've been given. The reason for the different line, it doesn't apply so much anymore, but it still happens. So there was a time when you would receive a phone call and the criminal would purport to be from the bank, and they'd actually say to you, um, 
you should be really careful. If you don't believe it's the bank, put your phone down and call us back on a number that you have and ask for me. My name's Julie McArdle or whatever. But they'd keep your phone line open. So even though you did replace the handset, you pick it up, you hear a dialing tone even, you dial a number, you could dial the police. Um, you'd just reconnect back to the same criminal or the, the same gang. And then don't trust caller ID. It can easily be manipulated. Again, we hear stories where victims tell us that their caller ID said NatWest fraud team and that they were directed to look at that by the caller. That proves it's us. We're definitely the fraud team. Again, easily achieved. There's lots of technology out there that's available to any of us that can achieve that for you. You can use this technology and put Barack Obama or Her Majesty the Queen and that's what will appear on your phone. There's a couple of scams that I just briefly want to talk to you about. Um, these are the scams that we're seeing our business customers fall victim to most often. If you haven't experienced this within your organisation, I'd be amazed and I'd say perhaps you're just not realising that you have. Bogus boss fraud is where a criminal will spoof or hack the email address of a senior executive or manager and basically send a payment request on email. Um, it's usually got a sense of urgency around it and the purpose is to get you to make the payment without question. The reason we've got a picture of Mattel there, nothing to do with the bank, just a story I saw in the press that was relevant. Mattel fell for this fraud. They sent a payment for £3 million, pounds, or $3 million um, a year or so ago. Um, what can you do? Well, check for irregularities. I worked, with, I worked with lots of victims of this fraud, but one of them said something to me that stuck, and they said... Um, do you know, I should have known that that email wasn't really from my boss because he was being too nice. Um, and often it's things like that that give it away. So within my office, there's, I think there's three Julies. I get called Jules a lot, certainly by certain colleagues. And if they, if they addressed me in any other way by email, I'd, I'd know it wasn't them. Um, consider the language used. Always contact the sender regardless of what it says. They will use events like this. So they'll, they'll scour LinkedIn or Twitter or other social media platforms to see where you are, and they might reference, oh, I'm at a cyber event in Staffordshire today, so don't try and call me, my phone's turned off. Um, or they might say, I'm at a family funeral, so you need to use a different phone number, or something like that. Um, you should use independently sourced contact details to call back and check that it's a genuine request. And follow your laid down procedures as well. Hopefully, you don't have a process within your business that says you can make a payment request by email. And if you do, then I really recommend you review that. I like an analogy that goes, sending an email is like writing a postcard written in pencil. It can be viewed, intercepted and amended at any point in its transmission. It is not a safe way to request a payment to be made. Um, and the last one is invoice redirect fraud. Again, known by different names, change of mandate details. So you have a supplier and you receive sometimes a warm-up phone call, first of all, from the supplier, um, advising you that they've um, changed their bank details and, um, and that they're going to send you written confirmation of this. And they might do that by email or fax or both. And that written confirmation will have all the logos that you expect it to have. It will have the right signatures, all the right details, because, of course, as David told us, um, it's all really readily available on Companies House. Um, and the purpose is to get you to change the details on your payment system so that the next invoice now is updated and the payment will go to the new account details. But, of course, it's come from a criminal. Um, what can you do? Again, it's really, really simple to avoid. Contact the supplier or the sender. Um, independently source contact details, again, to verify that it's a genuine instruction. Um, I worked with, again, I've worked with lots of businesses that have fallen for this. Um, one in particular stands in mind because it was a university, they, they lost £400,000 to this scam. And again, you can't go to your bank expecting a refund for this because you, you won't get one. Um, it's a payment that you've asked us to make. So they, they lost £400,000. We tried to recover. The money was gone. And that's bad enough, isn't it? But then the kicker point, the kicker um, is on this one. Not only have you just lost your £400,000, but actually you've still got to pay that supplier. You've got to find another £400,000 now. And that's not always easy to do. Um, and if you can't find another £400,000 or you can't pay your supplier, then is there a danger that they'll pull whatever they're supplying? And what will that do to your business? Will that bring your business down? Will that make you unable to operate? You know, there's, there's so much more to this um, to consider other than that initial loss. And it's just so very easy to avoid falling victim to. Just a quick phone call. I, I, I sometimes work with um, really large organisations and they'll say to me, we couldn't possibly call back all of these. And actually, when the ICB ring fencing comes in, so 
that's that punishment that the government put on the banks that said um, we have to separate out um, our retail banks from the rest of our business. And the impact of that is that quite a lot of um, customers will have a change in bank details. When that comes in, there'll be lots of people contacting you who have genuinely had their bank details changed. Um, and they'll say to me, we couldn't possibly call all these about. It's too much resource. It's too resource heavy. Well, that's fine. I get that. Um, so have a risk-based approach to it. If the contract is worth five grand a year to you, don't call it back if you don't want to. If it's worth half a million pounds a year, then call it back. You know, put in place um, some sort of process where you understand which ones you will call back and which ones you won't. Um, there's lots of help and support that's out there available to you, and um, we've had lots talked about today. Um, our websites have a lot of information. There's some videos there. Uh, there's, there's Cyber Essentials, which is Cyber Aware, this one here. Um, so if you do nothing else today or after today, um, then have a look at cyberaware.gov.uk. So it's a government-driven initiative. It's an online survey, essentially, that you can take to understand how savvy your business is when it comes to cyber. Um, you can do that for free, and then if you want um, a, a, a regulated or approved firm to come in and um, review you, then you can go on and pay um, to have that done. But there's a, there's a survey online that you can do that will give you just a very sort of basic idea of whether or not you're, you're doing the right things. Okay, I think that's me. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll be taking questions at the end. <laughs>